I'm not sure where to stand. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome everyone to Coral Gables Congregational Church. We are part of the United Church of Christ and we extend to you this welcome each and every time we gather that no matter who you are or where you are on your life journey, you are welcome here. And as we always say, the best part of that is it. So welcome. If you are a time visitor or guest with us today, we are so honored by your presence. To all of you who are worshiping with us online from around the world, we are so delighted to have you with us as well. As you came in this morning, visitors and guests, I hope that you were able to sign in and get a welcome bag. If you did not, please come to the fellowship hall after the service and we'll be sure to get you one. Those of you worshiping with us online for the first time, if you will leave your name and your address, we'll be sure to get you a bag out this week. It's got some great merch in it. So we will make sure that you get that. For those of you who are present in our beautiful historic space here today, we encourage you to come to our Connection Cafe immediately following our service. It is through those double doors that just opened with Ron Morgan there. So if you will go there, the really good news is today is Pie Sunday. So hey, we love a good Pie Sunday here at Gables UCC. So in preparation for Thanksgiving, we hope that you will come. Thank you all for bringing pies. There are so many in there and you have a piece or maybe even two, but please enjoy yourself. But more importantly, connect with one another. While you are in there, we encourage you to also sign up for the Thanksgiving volunteer extravaganza this Thursday from 8 to 11. We will be making meals, also bag lunches and hygiene kits. So come on in and sign up for that. Now, it's my great opportunity to introduce to you our special preacher for today. Last evening, we welcomed to this church the Reverend Nadia Bose Weber. And for those of you who were here, you know it was an extraordinary evening. Nadia began her presentation with a list of things that gives her anxiety and worry, which made me reflect afterwards, what would my list look like? I'm just gonna share a few of them. First, not being in this beloved community where the other is honored and welcomed, where we seek to practice radical hospitality, where we work at growing our faith, asking hard questions, and serving beyond ourselves. Number two, being too old to wear a Ziggy Stardust t-shirt. <laughs> you had to be here to, to get that one. And number three, a world where we don't have the prophetic, inspiring, meaningful, raw, humorous presence of the Reverend Nadia Bose Weber. We need her voice, her honesty, and her reminder of who we are and whose we are. Reverend Bose Weber is a Lutheran pastor in one of our partner denominations, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. She's also a best-selling author, public theologian, and the founding pastor of the House for All Sinners and Saints, a congregation in Denver, Colorado. And I really hope that she's my new best friend. <laughs> so please, let us welcome Nadia. I also just want to say a word of thanks to Pastor Megan and the Board of Spiritual Formation for making this all possible. Today is also, yes, indeed. Also, today is a meaningful day as it is the Transgender Day of Remembrance. And to bring a message or a word about it, I'd like to invite our church member Ashton forward. Ashton? Good morning, church. My name is Ashton Davila. November 20th is Transgender Day of Remembrance, the day when we memorialize trans people around the world who were murdered this year. 
and advocate for federal, state, and local protections for trans and non-binary people. Trans and non-binary people face some of the highest rates of physical violence with one out of four reporting a bias-driven assault in their lives. And the rates for trans people of color are even higher. Coral Gables Congregational United Church of Christ stands in solidarity with trans and non-binary people and calls for their safety, dignity, and flourishing. Last year, our Board of Justice and Witness gave a $2,500 grant to Trans Social, an organization here in South Florida that offers legal and social services to the trans community. You may have heard about Trans Social recently in the news as Ariana Grande gave them a large donation and they are now opening up two new resource centers in South Florida. If you would like to know more, please see the announcements on page eight of your bulletin. Today, we offer our prayers of mourning for the trans and non-binary people killed by transphobic violence and for a future where people of, of all gender identities and expressions are celebrated and loved. Thank you. Finally, just a word about our worship service this morning. If you have a prayer request, a prayer concern, or joy that you would like for me to lift up in our morning prayers, I invite you to text or email me that prayer request. And information for my text or email number is on the top of page six of your bulletin. Dear friends, in spite of the rain, this is indeed a beautiful day. It's a beautiful day because God has made it, and we have gathered here to rejoice and to be glad in it. So let us do so. Let us be together now in the spirit of worship.
Friends, would you please rise in body and spirit for our call to worship. Holy is the creator of the heavens and earth, of sunlight and starlight, forests and ocean. Holy is the composer of birdsong and thunderstorm. Let all creation sing praise. Holy is the one who was born in a stable, who knelt down in the dust to wash feet. Holy is the one whose crown was twisted thorns. Let all creation sing praise. Holy is the spirit who confounds the powerful, who lifts up the silence and forgotten. Holy is the love that breaks the rules of empire. Let all creation sing praise. No matter from where you are worshiping with us today, 
whether you're present here in this space or with us online, no matter the concerns, worries, or joys you bring, no matter your background or social status, your race, culture, faith, tradition, or sexual orientation, we offer you the peace of Christ this day. Peace be with you and also with you. Today's lesson is from God has looked favorably on the people and redeemed them. God has raised up a mighty savior for us in the house of David, as God spoke through the mouth of the holy prophets from of old, that we would be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Thus God has shown the mercy promised to our ancestors and has remembered the Holy Covenant, the oath that God swore to our ancestor, our ancestor Abraham, to grant us that we, being rescued from the hands of our enemies, might serve God without fear in holiness and righteousness in God's holy presence all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High for you will go before the Lord to prepare the holy way, to give God's people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to shine upon those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace.
The Gospel according to Luke, chapter 23, verses 33 to 43. When they came to the place that is called the Skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing, and the people stood by watching. But the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself if he is the Messiah of God, the Chosen One. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, Truly I tell you, today, you will be with me in paradise. Friends, listen, God is still speaking. Thanks be to God. Grace, peace, and mercy are yours from the triune God. Um, Before we get going, (laughs) I found out about five minutes before service started that there was a shooting uh, at a gay club in Colorado Springs last night. And um, and five children of God were killed. And um, I know that's a tender thing for this community, given the Pulse shooting. Um, That's about an hour from my house. So I texted my 21-year-old gay son five minutes ago to say, just tell me you're okay. Um, The canticle for today, Luke 1, I'm just, I'm really grateful for the last four lines that say, because of the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from all on high will break upon us to shine upon those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. So I ask that God guide our feet into the way of peace in this country. And I pray for all of the uh, people who have died in all their circles who love them. And I'm really glad to be in a room, um, in this room right now with you. Um, because sometimes all we have at our disposal is scripture and prayer and song. So I'm grateful to be here. So uh, I did not write a sermon on this, however. <laughs> so. I'm going to go with what I wrote, uh, but just know my heart is, um, is there. When someone I meet uh, for the first time, like, I don't know, on a plane or at a party, I wrote that line, and I'm like, how often am I at parties? Never. I don't know why I said that. Um, <laughs> uh, when I meet someone uh, for the first time, and they do that thing where they ask what I do for a living, Uh, and I say I'm a Lutheran pastor, they for sure look at me suspiciously, um, either because they're pretty sure I just lied to them uh, or because I now represent an institution that they distrust or they even despise, which I totally get. But the reaction... Cutting out? It is. Okay. Is it the rain? (laughs) Um... 
but the reaction that is the most exhausting is from people who for some reason feel like they have to justify why they don't go to church. Um, when in all honesty, and I can't state this strongly enough, I don't care. <laughs> Anyhow, one of the more interesting things folks will say to me is, I'm not religious or anything, I just hope that being a good person is enough. To which I always want to say, like, enough for what? The weird thing is these people who don't go to church are still hoping to, that being a good person is enough to avoid the punishment of burning in the eternal fires of some kind of imaginary hell they don't even believe in. <laughs> so no wonder people act weird when I say I'm a pastor, since apparently to so many of them, even those who have nothing to do with Christianity, I broker in some moral reward and punishment system, like we're all rats in some kind of cruel cosmic lab experiment, receiving shocks from God for going the wrong way and little reward pellets for going the right way in our existential maze. But Christianity has completely lost the plot. If it makes itself out to be some kind of sin management program for people who want to ensure they're good enough to avoid punishment. I mean, no doubt a reward and punishment system is pretty good for behavior management, but despite our history, Christianity isn't supposed to be about controlling the masses. Christianity is supposed to be about raising the dead. Because at its core, it's about forgiveness and reconciliation and mercy. Recently in a Q&A, someone asked me what I thought Jesus would think of the church were he to return today, assuming I'd say something like, He'd say, what's up with vestments and organ music? Uh, but instead, I answered, I think he'd wonder why his church doesn't talk about forgiveness of sins nearly as much as he did. Uh, I, I myself was raised Church of Christ, not United Church of Christ. Uh, and if you don't know the difference, Church of Christ is like Baptist plus. Uh, <laughs> And the, uh, the sermons I heard growing up use a, a technique called proof texting. Uh, proof texting is where the preacher uh, throughout their sermon would quote really random verses in the Bible and like pin them all up on a clothesline and say, look, obviously God agrees with me. Uh, it's not that hard if you have a book called a biblical concordance because you can just look up whatever it is you feel like shaming people about that week, like uh, divorce or women who talk back. And uh, it, will, it will list every verse pertaining to that topic. Uh, so here's what's humbling about that. I am just about to do the exact same thing. <laughs> uh, but I'm going to give them to you all at once. Here we go. Mark 1. Prepare the way of the Lord. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Matthew 9. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. Matthew 26, this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Matthew 9, the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Luke 24, and he said to them, thus it's written, the Messiah is to suffer and rise from the dead. And on the third day, in that uh, repentance and forgiveness of sins is to, to be proclaimed in his name. Acts 10, all the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives a toaster oven? No, forgiveness of sins through his name. <laughs> Acts 13, let it be known to you, therefore, my brothers, that through this man, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Colossians 1, he has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption and what? The forgiveness of sins. And finally, the canticle for today, Christ the King Sunday, is from the first chapter of Luke, and it's called the Benedictus. Thank you for singing it. It's a canticle. I loved that you sang it. Um, it's, it's where Zechariah is addressing his new infant. Spoiler alert, that's John the Baptist. Um, he says, And you, child, will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people. And how, you might ask, does one prepare people for Jesus? How does one give people knowledge of their salvation? Is it through telling them what they must do to be good enough to earn their salvation? Is it through 
uh, telling them what lifestyle and voting patterns and diet they must adopt to be righteous? No, as it says in Luke, it is by the forgiveness of their sin. It is not by enforcing some kind of action and consequence scheme. It's not by setting up moral purity systems and behavior codes. It's by subverting them. Forgiveness of sins. It's the whole thing. It's the whole thing. And yet it's so rarely mentioned. I get why forgiveness of sins hasn't been, you know, it's not had great PR, and uh, it hasn't been like the main focus of Christianity. I mean, first of all, the term sin isn't super popular since it's so often been weaponized and used as shorthand for like, I don't know, like naughty indulgences, good people avoid that, or it's shorthand for regular things regular people do that the so-called good people wish we would feel bad about. But the British writer Francis Spufford defines sin, uh, and I'm not going to use the full word because it's worship and Sunday morning, but he says, sin is just the human propensity to F things up. I just find that very helpful. Because if that is sin, then A, I for sure have it, and B, so does everyone else. The other reason forgiveness of sins isn't a terribly popular message is that it just, it goes against our carceral culture and our instincts. I mean, mercy for me, fine, but mercy for everyone who's ever hurt me? No. They should get what they deserve. This is the cycle we're trapped in. We think recompense or retribution will fix everything, and of course it never does. Seldom does the harm someone has done to us heal by harming them back. But boy, we keep trying. Hurt people keep hurting people. We want to erase the shame and pain of being hurt by hurting back, but it never works that way. Why do you think Hollywood cranks out so many films about revenge? Because it feels good for a minute. But revenge is an empty promise. And if, as Luther says, we are all simultaneously sinner and saint, 100% of both all the time, if we are all beloved bearers of God's image and at the same time unavoidably flawed, what do we do with this? What do I do with the fact that there is some twisted part of me that thinks the worst thing for me would for sure be the best thing for me? Things like alcohol, in my case, and getting back at someone who's hurt me and eating two whole pints of Ben and Jerry's for dinner and uh, posting my opinions on Twitter. <laughs> and the twisted little unreliable narrator in me that Fs things up has really done some harm harmed my friendships and my family. It's harmed my own self-regard. It's for sure harmed my employability. <laughs> <laughs> and even harmed the planet. And what am I to do about the fact it all builds up over a lifetime? Ignore it? Maybe twist myself into pretzels trying to make all of it the fault of other people but never me? I mean, that's a time-worn tradition. Do I despair? Do I minimize? Are there enough cleanses and silent retreats and self-help schemes to clean this mess up? I'll go ahead and answer my own question. No, there isn't. But what there is, what there is, my friends, is a God who makes all things new. What there is is a much bigger truth and a bigger reality than my own little self-obsessed world. What there is is grace, and plenty of it. Unbidden, unearnable, eternal divine mercy. To the ears of this sinner, that is good news. Because if I got what I deserved, I'd for sure be screwed. To be clear, grace is not about God being a good enough guy to forgive me for my failings. Grace is about God being a source of wholeness and redemption and healing, which makes up for my failings. Grace to me is God's source code. It's where we all came from, our origin. 
And when we don't have enough on our own, there always is enough. And confessing our sins, or if you're in a 12-step program, completing a moral inventory and speaking it to another person, that isn't the way we earn forgiveness. It's just the way we force our egos into a posture where we can receive forgiveness, receive what is already there, just waiting for us to avail ourselves of it. So today on Reign of Christ Sunday, I want you to know that Jesus didn't go through all the bother of being made human and walking among us and teaching and preaching and healing and suffering death on the cross and descending to hell and a bodily resurrection just for us to use his name to control the behavior of more interesting people than ourselves. (laughs) It was for forgiveness of sins. It was so we could just stop thinking an eye for an eye is going to help us. It's so that we can stop relitigating crimes against our parents. It's so we can stop beating ourselves up for stuff in the past. Martin Luther once wrote that it is not God but the devil who rummages through our garbage looking for already forgiven sins to rub our noses in saying this is who you really are. But the same goes for the already forgiven sins of others too. Which means there's nothing you can do that God cannot redeem. Your failings are never going to be the final word. Friends, all the grace and forgiveness and mercy and reconciliation of God is already yours. You are forgiven. And so is everyone you resent. (laughs) I always say with my luck, I'll be seated at the heavenly banquet between Ann Coulter and some racist cop. (laughs) (laughs) And by the way, you can forget that whole, I hope being a good person is enough. That's not even really a thing. The love and grace of God is a thing. And it's enough, and all of it, every single ounce of it, is already yours. It will not be taken away as a punishment. It will not be granted as a reward. It is your inheritance as a freed child of God. Amen. Amen.
heaven from death he was set free now he sits at the right hand and he's waiting for you and me Let's pray. O oh, Holy One, the source, the story, the spirit of love, we praise you for the signs of your reign among us, for hope overcoming despair, trust rising above hurt, love prevailing over hatred, and peace restoring harmony after discord. We know that before time existed, Holy One, you were there. Before the world came into being, you were there. Long after this creation fades away, you will continue to be. 
Your steadfast love endures forever. Yet much has cluttered our lives, making it hard for us to recall or even to experience anew the wonder and awe of your power and presence. We worry and despair over news of hate crimes, gun violence, threats of more death and unrest in Ukraine, Haiti, the Middle East, the anger and ignorance coming from our own elected leaders, the sickness of loved ones, and our own personal struggles to find health and wholeness. We get so caught up in our worries and busyness that we forget that you are present in all the broken places in our lives and throughout the world. Long before we drew lines on our maps that separate one people from another, you claimed us all as your beloved. Your capacity for grace and forgiveness is beyond our understanding. We live in such narrow places and hold on to things that just don't do us one bit of good. We need your help in building that beloved community that the world so desperately needs. We all need, and we know it's going to take a huge effort at forgiveness. Big, huge shifts and tiny nudges of our hearts, opening ourselves in ways that we perhaps could never even have imagined. Each movement is step toward the possibility of reconciliation and relationship, and even transformation. So here we are again, facing what we know to be true. It's brave and gritty and powerful and freeing to unclench our fist from the false security of resentment and to open our hearts to the possibility of love. And it is in such love we pray for others this day, those on our minds and our hearts, even those unknown to us and only to you, O oh God. And so we pray for folks by name or situation. We are especially mindful today of the victims of the Club Q, a gay nightclub in Colorado Springs. We pray for those who have lost their lives, those who have been injured, those whose hearts are broken, those whose lives will never again be the same. Why, oh God, we ask, why can there not be peace? Why is there so much violence and hatred? Help us to discern the way. We also pray for Esther as she recuperates from surgery, for Bill and his hospitalization, for all who struggle with depression and anxiety, for Anne as she continues to recover from surgery, for Susan as she faces upcoming chemo, for Mark whose cancer has spread, for Gerald's grandmother who's having severe health complications, for Hildy on the passing of her mother, for Elaine as she faces radiation treatment, for Josette, whose husband was kidnapped in Port-au-Prince, Haiti on Monday. For Sue, who fell and broke her hip and pelvis. For Debbie, who has been diagnosed with terminal cancer. We pray for Felipe as he enters hospice care and for his wife, Carmen, as she cares for him. Prayers offered up for one's exquisite community activist brother, who was just diagnosed with cancer. We lift before you the health of one's parents and thanks for the safe keeping of her daughters in travel. We lift before you this day, Laura's father, may his soul indeed rest in peace. We pray for Aunt Nora who passed away peacefully on Friday. We give thanks as well on this special day as the Twinning Clark family celebrates the birth of Oliver Strong Finch, who came running into the world this week. We are so grateful for this new life and for all of the ways that we find new life in this world. We pray for guidance for one's children 
and for Louise, who is recovering from lung surgery. We give thanks for having Nadia with us today and give thanks for her ministry, her words, and her presence. We also pray for Kathy as she embraces God's assignment to care for caregivers and the loved ones that they are called to care for. We finally pray, O oh God, this day for all of our elected leaders. Inspire them to seek the good of all and to ignore whatever political cost there may be to themselves for the sake of peace and kindness, health, and well-being of all. O oh God, at the quiet and the chaos, come to us once again in this time of prayer. Silence our anxieties and fears, humble our desire for greatness, fill us with compassion. You have claimed us as your people to serve in your name wherever we find ourselves. And even though we are often distracted from what is truly important, we are grateful. We are grateful that we are your people here and now and that your love for us will never end. Trusting in your eternal promises, we lift before you all of these prayers, both spoken and those that lie deep within our hearts. In the name of Christ, amen. Once again, we give thanks for your presence with us today here at Gables UCC. We know that each of you came here this morning for different reasons, to find community, to seek your spiritual or personal truths, to question, to nurture your heart and soul, to find comfort, perhaps to seek some answers to some of life's big questions, to find ways to reach out beyond yourself and to relish and to hear up close and personal Reverend Bose Weber. We hope you have indeed found some comfort this day, some connection, some challenge, some hope, and even the love of Christ here. And so we ask you as we do each week, that we invite you to give, to share, and to belong to this community of faith. First, I invite you to give financially to the work, the ministry, and the mission of this church. Your gifts help us do amazing things, both within these walls and even more importantly, out in the community and wider world. You may give online through your smartphone, through offering plates at the doors for your donations. More information about giving is on page 14 of your bulletin. We are so very grateful for what you entrust to our care and the ways that we can serve others through your generosity locally and globally. We also invite you to share of your time and your talent. There are countless ways of serving and sharing your gifts and your time. This Thursday morning, our Thanksgiving volunteer extravaganza is one such opportunity. And I invite you to take a look at the bulletin for so many other ways of being involved. Finally, if you are seeking a spiritual home and would like to know more about membership here at Gables UCC, please see me or any of the pastors following worship 
or be sure to attend our next inquirers gathering this month. For those interested in inquiring more about the church, what we stand for, value, witness to, and believe, come, be a part of our community. We welcome you whether you live close by or in another state or even another country from online. So as always, dear church community, thank you. Thank you for all of the ways that you bring hope into lives, into our community and into our wider world. And I would invite you now to stand as you are able as we sing together our closing hymn. Go with Christ reigning in your heart and over all of your actions today. Go as God's own people, blessed with an inheritance that is imperishable. Amen and amen.